three to as much as five inches of rain are possible. And because of that, we've got flood watches through early Saturday morning. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Norcross. I'll be along with uh, Ian Oliver and uh, Bridget Mahoney here in just a moment to talk about the weather. But we're going to talk about the tropics, and we're doing something different here this afternoon and something new that I hope you're going to enjoy. All, we're also, as well as being on Fox Weather, we're also live on Facebook, on my Facebook page, Brian Norcross Weather, and on the Fox Weather Facebook page, and on the Fox Weather YouTube channel. So you can watch this program, uh, Advisory at 5 with Brian Norcross. It's uh, 5 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Central Time, of course. And we're going to take your questions, and in the second half of the half hour, we're going to answer your questions. You can send us something thing on the, the tropics on E, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some questions I've gotten about the E and storm surge. Or you can ask about uh, something that Ian or Bridget are talking about, because there is a lot going on uh, in the weather as we're into the fall season and things are changing now. We do have a new advisory from uh, the National Hurricane Center on uh, Tropical Storm Carl. And Tropical Storm Carl has 45 mile an hour winds. You see the five o'clock advisory advisory there. Uh, moving now to the south-southeast, so it's moving here toward the Mexican coast. No big changes. It's actually sort of coming unraveled. Uh, the big threat from Carl is going to be heavy rain. We'll talk more about that here coming up in just a moment. But for now, let me send it uh, back to the Fox Weather Studios, and Ian is going to talk about this cold front that has an effect on Carl as well. There's a lot of weather going on um, around the eastern half of the U.S. It certainly yeah. is, and it's messy, Brian. In the mid-Atlantic and up into the northeast, we've got a severe weather threat. We've also got a flooding threat that lingers all the way into the very early part of the weekend. So that's what's happening right now. But again, this is a good time. Jump on Facebook. We live in a, a two-screen world now. Grab your cell phone. If you're watching us on a big TV, you can go on the Fox Weather Facebook or on Brian Norcross's Facebook page. If you've got any questions about what's left of this tropical season, that's the guy to answer him for you. So just use that resource as we have it. What you see on your screen right now, that's the severe weather setup, unfortunately. We've got high pressure out in the Atlantic. That's helping to pump up some deeper atmospheric moisture from the south. Some of that originated in the Gulf. Some of it's from the Atlantic. That's the cold front, and that's the agent of potential severe weather as we move on through the next several hours. And overall, a flooding threat that has a much longer fuse overnight tonight and throughout the day Friday for portions of the Northeast. We'll talk about that. Here's the radar right now for the time being as I'm glancing up at the Fox weather system. No active severe thunderstorm warnings, thankfully, but that could change quickly. You do see out ahead of and along this front, some of the storms that have formed, and these are going to be pushing through with some gusty winds, and we should point out the timing of all this. We're going to be moving through the evening commute along the I-95 corridor, so this is problematic from far northern parts of North Carolina all the way up into uh, upstate New York. There's a very low-end tornado threat. It's isolated, but we'll be watching any of the stronger storms that develop closely for you here at Fox Weather just to make sure they're not displaying any signs of rotation. You see the wet weather move Moving in, you know that translates to airport delays. We got some of those down at Reagan and DC, all of the NYC area airports uh, dealing with at least some delays, and those may trend upward over the next few hours. Darker green is what I was mentioning across interior parts of the Northeast. That's where, unfortunately, some flash flooding is likely. And because of that, Bridget, we've got these flood watches that have been issued for a good portion of the Northeast. That runs all the way through Saturday morning. Some areas could see up to five inches of rain. A lot of folks in the Northeast need this rain, but nobody needs flooding, of course. A little bit of a catch-22. You don't want to see the flooding, especially when it comes to the morning as well as evening commutes, especially this evening as people are headed home. As we head off to the south, we're talking about a similar situation in terms of the rainfall. We hope to not see flash.
flash flooding in this region because they saw it extensively two weeks ago with Hurricane Ian, but we're still seeing some ongoing light showers from Fort Myers along I-75 to the south, up to the north, Sarasota, Tampa. You saw rain earlier today, but that shows a drying trend. Nice to see that through the later half of the afternoon. As we look at more of a detailed view with our radar, we're also showing some pretty extensive rain from South Miami Heights farther off to the south. We see the radar loop. This is where some areas have seen localized really heavy downpours just south of Miami. That's where we're hearing reports of ongoing flash flooding situations for that uh, 5 to 6 p.m. drive home. This is a look at in Miami. It looks like this is a flood report coming in from Miami showing social media video of uh, street flooding at the intersection of Brickell Avenue as well as Southeast 14th Street water level appearing above the curb and of course could take away some of those cars. Let's look at our Fox model through the rest of the evening. We continue to see a lot of green on the map. We keep the rain showers in the forecast through about 10 p.m. and even beyond midnight. We may see a few spot rain showers, especially on the east side of the peninsula. Tomorrow morning we start dry. This is a look at 7 a.m. That's nice to see, but by the afternoon, that's where storms rolling back in this time actually from the east moving off to the west where we may see a a few isolated spots of really heavy rain and those rain totals can add up quickly. Let's just hope that these storms stay in motion and it does install out over one specific area uh, or another. You see right now potentially some pretty uh, extensive flooding for these rivers. This is where we have some major flood stage still in effect from Orlando South Fort Pierce. That's where we could see about an inch of rain farther off to the south Miami Homestead one to two inches expected over the next five days where we have those ongoing flash flooding situations. Ian. Bridget, the time of the year, all these storms have warm sides and cold sides. We got the warm side of the storm covered. We got to talk about the cold side, which features a bad word, the possibility of some snow through the overnight hours tonight. And in some places, the first accumulating snow of the season. We're talking about the upper Midwest and the problem with this. It's the same overall storm system. So you've got this double barrel area of low pressure. All of that is up in Canada. That's the cold front associated with this storm system, which is what's generating the severe weather and the flooding threat as we move forward. But the overall circulation counterclockwise around these areas of low pressure just tugs down all that cold air from Canada and you get these mini cold fronts troughs of low pressure that pivot in and that generates a snow threat in some of these areas it also pumps down the cooler air that I was talking about you notice the warm side and the cold side of these systems 75 right now in Raleigh 70 in DC 68 here in uh, New York not bad at all just 42 though in Minneapolis and getting colder by the minute really with that north wind. That's the 24 hour temperature change anywhere from five to as much as 20 degrees cooler right now as compared to this time yesterday. There's your threat for up to two inches of snow. It's a possibility, particularly as you get a bit closer to that Canadian border and future track shows you just that as we head on through the overnight hours tonight as these temperatures dip below freezing international falls down to Bemidji. Those are snow showers 11 p.m. Central time right through the overnight hours tonight pivoting farther off to the south and east. You can see that overall swirl associated with the area of low pressure. And as we move on through the afternoon hours tomorrow, of course, it warms up. We'll see more of those transitioning back over to just a cold rain shower. So overall, not the best weather setup. And with that area of low pressure being a slow mover, you're stuck in it for a little bit into the early part of the weekend. That's the snow forecast. Brighter blues here indicating one, maybe up to two inches of snow, mostly on those elevated or grassy surfaces. The ground is still warm this time of the year. We know that, but could be one of those mornings. If you live in these areas, you wake up, you got some slush on your windshield first thing. So Brian, that's what's happening. We'll have much more on the severe weather threat, the flooding threat that persists across the Northeast into the early part of the weekend. We'll send it back over to you for an update on the tropics. Ian, I know you worked in Florida and you're looking at that cold front this time <laughs> of year. Sometimes they fool us, right? They don't Big actually time. come through. Yeah, but never uh, a front this until one the but, front that comes through and finally the humidity <laughs> goes. 
Right. Well, yeah, so I don't think there's any question that Tampa's going to go through. But here in Miami, the it is a gloomy, rotten day out there today, I can tell you. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's always the question is, is it really going to clear the keys? Kind of looks like this one, this first one will. And the one next week, probably for sure. Anyway, that's my forecast. <laughs> okay. All right, Ian and, and Bridget, I'll see you back uh, in a little bit. Okay, let's take a look at what's going on with Tropical Storm Carl and across the tropics right now. I told you about the 5 o'clock advisory. Winds held at 45 miles per hour, and they're in this cluster of thunderstorms here. Let's go close up on that, and you can see here that when we enhance the, the taller thunderstorm clouds, you see a couple things. First of all, you see the thunderstorms kind of moving away from the center. Here's the center that the National Hurricane Center is noting, and the thunderstorms are all moving away. And look at this edge here. That edge there is where the dry air is pushing in from the northwest, and that's a very unhealthy situation for tropical storms. So this one doesn't have a whole lot of time. It's kind of moving toward the Mexico coast down that way. doesn't have a lot of time, but this is going to be where the worst weather is going to be on the east side of the system as it goes south. So when we add the upper-level winds, you can see exactly what's happening. You can see them blowing in here from the northwest, uh, kind of tearing the storm apart. That's why it's not going to intensify. This isn't going to be a big deal storm in terms of the wind, but it is going to bring quite a bit of rain. And look at this kind of blistering wind across the Gulf here. When we, this is a sign of the fall season arriving. When we get that kind of a jet stream wind, subtropical jet technically, across the Gulf of Mexico, it's a sign that uh, we can't get any storms over Florida or the Gulf Coast or the East Coast in that kind of condition. All the tropical air is down here to the south. Now, show that in a little different way uh, to you in just a second. But here is the the uh, projected uh, path from the National Hurricane Center for uh, Carl. And there you see it weakens a little bit. So it comes ashore as basically a 40 mile an hour tropical storm very near this uh, port city here. Let me try this. Coatzacoalcos. Coatzacoalcos. Co Coatza Coalcos. Yes, I think that's right. <laughs> anyway, it's a it's a you know it's a busy uh, port city there in in uh, Tabasco Province in uh, Mexico. The province right over here, by the way, is called. Uh, Campeche or Campeche? Uh, Campeche in Spanish, obviously. Ian, I want to know, you pronounce it uh, the, the bay up here. Uh, uh, Campeche, I pronounce it Campeche. I don't know, I've always done that, uh, the English pronunciation. But bottom line is it's going to die out here over the mountains, uh, and the heavy yeah, rain over Mexico really is the big, big threat. So here you see... Uh, uh, here you see the rain uh, uh, threat from this thing, which is the big thing. And most of it, the heaviest rain is going to be on that east side with that big cluster of thunderstorms. All going to die out over the mountains, but there is a threat for significant uh, flooding there over those higher elevations. So what's going on as the fall pattern is arriving here across the south? The main thing is that high pressure here is pushing down on the storm, and that's driving it down south, uh, down to the Mexican coast. Now watch what happens. Here we are today. Watch what happens here over the next couple days. Well, the high kind of spreads over, pushes Carl down south. Here comes the cold front. The brown areas are dry air, dry air of Florida. We love that when a cold front finally comes through here in October. And the thinking is that it's actually going to be more robust, another more robust one next week. Here on the uh, water vapor with the winds, we can see those strong winds I was talking about. We see the line there with the dry air. The oranges are dry, pushing into the tropical air, kind of pushing hurricane season away is one way to think about it. Across the country, it's kind of interesting. We can kind of make out here the jet stream is doing this, and then it's dipping down over here. And that's what uh, Bridget and uh, Ian have been talking about, is that big dip in the jet stream and the storminess that all that's causing in the east. We'll talk more about that uh, in uh, detail. It's interesting how the western weather and the eastern weather are kind of complementary. On the other side of the Atlantic, there is another uh, disturbance out there. Not going to really amount to anything. It's going to move north in the Atlantic and not threaten land, a 20% chance that it's going to develop into a tropical depression right now.
So we're going to take a pause and we're going to come back and answer some of your questions. I know one of the questions I already saw came in is, is hurricane season over? That's a really good question. We'll have that uh, after a break and I'll be back with uh, Ian and Bridget and your questions when we come back in just a moment. This weekend, history making weather. First, from the Bahamas to the Carolinas, retracing Hurricane Dorian's path of destruction. Then, horrific crashes from land, sea, and air. How weather can turn deadly in an instant. This weekend on Fox Weather. The Omaha Steaks semi annual sale is here. Right now, we're offering 50% off site wide. The only number that hasn't changed is our 100% guarantee that you'll love every bite. And if you've never tried Omaha Steaks, save an extra $30 with promo code FIRSTTIME. Visit omahasteaks.com slash TV today. Why wouldn't you want to save 50% on 100% satisfaction? Just a little smart shopping wisdom from Omaha Steaks. I have over my 30 years seen many patients who have excessive sweating. It is very much a confidence killer. Excessive sweating is not something you have to live with. I recommend Carpe for my patients. Carpe is by far the most effective antiperspirant I've ever used. I love Carpe. Now I don't sweat. Effective and affordable. It's a game changer. Avoid expensive treatments, injections, and prescriptions. Your total body sweat solution is available at mycarpe.com. Visit today and get free shipping. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers, from a leading financial firm on maximizing your income in retirement. That's right, free. This free book reveals little known secrets about annuity strategies in simple to understand terms that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. And it's free. And as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report. This report covers over 1,200 annuities and summarizes benefits and rates of annuities from financially strong insurers. That's right, annuity do's and don'ts for baby boomers. And a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free for calling Annuity Mutual today. Supplies are limited. Call now. 800-829-5803. That's 800-829-5803. And welcome back on the Advisory at Five. I'm along with Ian Oliver and Bridget Mahoney. And we're going to take your questions here in a moment. They're coming in on Facebook and YouTube. If you're watching on Fox Weather, you can go over to your, 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 the Fox Weather Facebook page, my Facebook page, or the Fox Weather YouTube page. You can put in your questions about anything to do with the weather, including the tropics. But first of all, uh, we talked about the nasty weather here in Miami today. We have a live uh, camera that is just north of downtown. Miami, just off of uh, 395 at the e exit ramp. Do we have that uh, live picture? Well, and in any case, there's flooding near downtown Miami. So there, oh, there you see it. Okay, so this is a big construction zone down there. And um, you can see where there's the cars come off of 395 heading toward Miami Beach, trying to get to downtown Miami, trying to get to um, the area around the Performing Arts Center and so forth. Uh, it's flooded. I can tell you it was torrential rain here a little while ago in Miami Beach, and now that's moved down south of downtown Miami. But residual flooding around the city also flooding down on uh, Brickell Avenue as well, which is going to be horrendous here for the afternoon commute. OK, let's uh, take a look at the hurricane season, and then we'll talk uh, to talk tropics just a, a little bit, and then we'll get to your questions. Here, hurricane season so far this year, we've had 11 named storms. 11. Uh, remember, this was supposed to be a busy season. Most of the forecasts were, were up in the 18, 19, 20 range. The average for the whole season is 14. But remember that that average goes back to 1991. So that's 1991 to 2020. And in the 90s, we didn't have the technology that we have today. So we didn't count as many storms as we do today. So actually, that number is a little bit low. So we'll see if we get some more. We still have time to get some more to add to the official name storm list, but uh, it's probably not going to be much more than average, may not, may not even make uh, average. Hurricanes 5 compared to 7 on average, and uh, Category 3 and above, we've had 2 so far this year. So this uh, Carl, uh, Tropical Storm Carl, is forming. Look where the bright yellows are. This is where October storms most often form 
bam, right there where Carl formed, the southern Gulf of Mexico. The other place down here in the Caribbean, which is where Ian formed, Ian was more like an October storm. It just happened at the end of September. So both of those, that's the zone we look at, Caribbean and Gulf, uh, this time of year. All right, so let's talk about your questions. Uh, the one question I'm going to start with, because I've been asked this several times, and I was asked this uh, yesterday when we were going to do this, when we had the severe weather, and that's the related to the storm surge in the uh, Fort Myers, Fort Myers Beach area. So as you know, the worst storm surge was in Fort Myers Beach here and over on Sanibel. So, and then up here in Cape Coral, there was great fear that Cape Coral is very low lying, especially the southern part. And Cape Coral is the biggest city, it turns out, in southwest Florida. Just a lot, a lot, a lot of people live there. And there's a lot of waterways that go up into Cape Coral. And it didn't flood terribly. They did get storm surge on the south side, but it wasn't a big, uh, horrendous uh, you know, scary disaster there like we were afraid. Why was that? Well, here was the track of Ian up here. And remember that uh, there's a counterclockwise circulation around it. So here comes the, the circulation like this. Well, what was that did is that put a tremendous amount of water over Sanibel here because that was all pushing water on shore. The flow out here put water into and over Fort Myers Beach and then down here into Bonita Beach. All all had significant destruction everywhere near the water and then even a little uh, farther south down to Naples because that was the onshore flow. But look, in order to get water up into Cape Coral, you need a flow more like this. You need it to come out of the south a little more. So, and we didn't get that just because of the angle approach. For, so for a storm that's moving more like this, then that's going to put water into Cape Coral and Matlache and, and so forth. Now, when, as Ian went past and the water came back this way, Look, that's going to drive this water on the backside of Sanibel down across the causeway here. This is where the Sanibel Causeway got washed out, up here at the Matlache Causeway going over to Pine Island. So once the storm went by and you had that north wind, then you got tremendous amount of water moving that way. So some water came in against those causeways on the front end. More water came in on the back end. I don't know yet which one got it, but got those causeways, but they're very low lying and they're like dams holding the water back. So the water doesn't want to be held back. So the water is going through uh, those uh, those causeways. There's, you know, that's the thing about blocking the water that normally flows with a causeway. In um, 1960 and uh, 1965, by the way, there were hurricanes that hit the Keys, Donna and Betsy. Both times it took out the bridges and the Keys in six places. So it's the same thing. When you dam up where the water wants to flow, you're going to uh, have a problem. So, all right, let me uh, send it back to uh, Bridget and, um, and Ian, and uh, you have, uh, you've been monitoring some of the questions coming in. Guys? Yeah, Brian, we got some questions for you. I, I wanted to start first. You mentioned in, in forecast model land, it's a big teaser this time of the year for folks that live down in Florida. It's not until that first proper cold front sweeps on through, all of a sudden the rain chances are gone, the humidity is gone. But that's tied directly to what you were saying about the tropical season moving forward. And that front next week looks very impressive. So just as a general rule for you when you're doing tropical forecasting toward the end of the season it's when a front finally sweeps all the way through florida down to the bahamas or perhaps the caribbean when are you most comfortable saying all right we're probably all right here for the the tropical season coming to a close at least in relation to some of these cold fronts well, uh, yeah, I totally agree that once we get a strong cold front, now this first cold front really isn't that strong. It's going to kind of limp through South Florida. In Central Florida, it's going to be gangbusters. North Florida, all across the Southeast, is going to be a big deal. Here in South Florida, it's going to kind of limp through. It's still going to be so oh, I don't know, in the 80s as we get to uh, the, the weekend and after the front. So it's not going to be cold, but it will be drier. But next week's front, if it does what the models say, I think that'll put the nail in the coffin probably for the southeastern U.S. in terms of, and you know, the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, Florida for hurricane season. It doesn't end the threat for farther south in the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and out in the Atlantic. So it's not like we're necessarily done with named storms. 
and sometimes you can get a freaky storm. For instance, in November in uh, Miami, there was a storm in 1935 that came out of the Northeast. It came from Bermuda down and hit Miami. The eye went right over downtown, and it was a hurricane. So they called it the Yankee Hurricane. So that was a weirdo storm that didn't come out of the tropics. So weird stuff can still happen, but I think the best way to describe it is probably hurricane season is over for the southeastern U.S., um, probably. Almost likely. Avoid one of those Hopefully. bizarro storms for sure, Brian. <laughs> right, Mother Nature, yeah. the tropics, always at times keeping us on our toes even into the late months of the hurricane season. We do have a question from a viewer, Teresa Yan. She says, I'm wondering how the last month of the season is playing out in your opinion. Are the conditions over the next month forecasted to be less conductive to development in late October and as well as early November? And uh, we're wondering, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so the answer to the question is yes, they are uh, predicted to be less conducive. So they run computer models out a couple of weeks that we look at. We don't normally want to make forecasts beyond about a week, and sometimes even even five days makes beyond going beyond five days makes us nervous. But they do run these forecasts out to talk about the general weather pattern, and the general weather pattern over our part of the world. In other words, go looking all the way from the Pacific to the Atlantic is for unconducive, unsupportive weather pattern over the Atlantic. So uh, that also adds to the thought that uh, whatever happens for the rest of the hurricane season, it's probably not going to be big. And, and given the general weather pattern of having this big uh, high pressure in the western part of the country and low pressure in the eastern part of the country, that, uh, you know, that is also not conducive to having more storms affect the U.S. You touched on this a little bit, Brian, but this next question comes in from Ann Sheckman Axon, and she's asking, what are the chances down in South Florida that we're in the clear for the rest of the hurricane season? And like you said, it's related to if we can see those fronts actually sweep all the way through South Florida. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's uh, the odds are that we're done. Uh, that you know, that's not 100 percent, but the odds are that, especially you know, as you know, having forecast weather in Florida, and a lot of times the models show some strong cold front blasting through. And uh, then it, you know, the next day it's not quite the same blast, and the next day it's a little weaker and a little weaker, right? So the the long range computer models show a big cold front blasting through here uh, next week, maybe holding temperatures even in the 70s if it comes through that way. If if that happens or anything like that, I think that will pretty much end hurricane season. Um, I think this cold front that's coming through here the next couple of days. Probably will, probably will, and then the one next week almost certainly will. So uh, I'm not looking for anything here in South Florida anytime soon. Nice it, to see that. Yeah. The, the initial front we see now calling in for backup. Another <laughs> front yes. to eventually kind of dwindle out the tropical season. Yeah, a surplus season. of fronts. Yeah, I remember it's a glorious time of the year for a lot of reasons down in Florida. I moved to Florida in the month of May, which I don't recommend. But by the time you get to this time of the year and that first proper front comes through, you're like, I get it. This is... This yeah. is why folks live down here. This is fantastic. And it also finally brings the end of uh, tropical season slowly. We can't take and our uh, guard down good yet. Good for some of those recovery efforts that are ongoing in southwest Florida, all because of Hurricane Ian. Brian Norcross, great hearing your inside, of course. Uh, hoping to do this again as we continue in hurricane season. All right. Selling a home is expensive and stressful. So we set out to create a better home selling experience with a network of the most successful real estate agents in America that'll sell your home for as little as a 2% commission. The icing on the cake with the ideal agent was that we saved $12,000 in commission. We would definitely use ideal agent again. They, they, the whole process was so positive for us. Excellent, excellent service. Getting right to the point, hiring ideal agent, I wish we would have done that sooner and we would have saved six